Hello my dear students of grade 8. Today I am going to discuss with you all the second lesson of your science textbook that is animal classification. So you already know about different organisms. You all know what microorganisms are and the organisms that we can see with our naked eye, the macroorganisms. So under that you are familiar with animals and plants. Now why do we need to classify animals? Have you thought of that? I'm sure you would have. Now if you look at your environment around you, there are so many different types of animals. So that is called as diversity. There is a diverse range of animals. What is the meaning of diverse or diversity? They are all different from each other. So like that there are so many different types of animals. Now if we go to study about animals, now if we have to look at them individually, you have to at a certain, after a certain level you have to study them individually. But for now even for the scientists if they have to look at each type of dog, each type of cat or each type of fish separately only that will be very very difficult. So in order to make it easy and more systematic what they did was they classified animals for that matter they classified all the organisms. You are familiar with the classification technique what is that? The dichotomous key. What do you all do there? You look at the animal, you look at their features carefully and then you say okay these have legs, these do not have legs and you classify them. Like that you keep on separating the animals until you end up with one animal with a certain set of characters. So that is a dichotomous key. That is one simple way of classifying. But that is not enough to classify all these vastly diverse animals. So that is why we are going to discuss a scientific method of classification. I will explain that in a while. So before we do that, we will first see the topics that are discussed under this lesson. So two topics. Under animal classification, we will discuss the main invertebrate groups. You are familiar with this term, invertebrate, the vertebral column. The vertebral column at the back of our body, that is why we call it the backbone. So some animals don't have the backbone, some have the backbone. So the main invertebrate groups, the animals that do not have backbone, they have been further divided into groups. And the main vertebrate groups, animals with the backbone, so they are also divided into many groups. Here we will be looking at a few of those groups and we will try to understand how these animals are classified into groups. So then if we go into the lesson grouping of animals in a systematic way. This is very important. Now you can't just randomly classify as you wish. Now if you just think of the animals you can talk about the legs they have whether they have legs or no legs or four legs two legs. So like that you can classify if you do it randomly there can be many different classifications. You know even when your teacher tells you to make the dichotomous key. Now if you have 10 students making a dichotomous key, most probably they will all make it in 10 different ways. So there it's difficult to compare. So what scientists do is they classify animals in a systematic way by considering their common features. Now for example, you all know the bat and the parrot. They look similar. They can both fly. They have wings. But you all know they are different. 
Likewise, if we take a whale and a fish, they both live in the sea. They look similar. So, we assume that they are similar type of animals, but they are not. So, in order to understand all those, they do a systematic classification considering common features. When we say features, many features, not just one or two. So, the outer appearance, where they live, how they move, that is the locomotion, what they eat, that is the type of food consumed by them or the mode of nutrition. All that is how they respire, how they reproduce, all those features are considered. So, that method is animal classification. Grouping of animals in a systematic way by considering their common features is known as animal classification. So, animals can be classified based on different criteria. Now, we have discussed it again and again. Different criteria. Presence of legs, absence of legs. Presence of wings, absence of wings. Or marine animals, terrestrial animals. Animals that live in the sea, animals that live on land. So, like that we can consider many criteria or many features. But here one of the common ones is based on the presence or absence of a vertebral column. So you know what a vertebral column is. Now we are vertebrates, we are animals or we are people with a vertebral column or a backbone. So like that you know the backbone. From our head at the back of our body, you can feel the presence of backbone. The same way, if you look at a dog, you know it has a backbone. A deer, a cow, all these have backbones. So, those are animals that have a backbone. But if you take a snail or if you look at a cockroach, then you will know they don't have a backbone. So animals like those do not have a backbone or a vertebral column. So based on that, we classify animals mainly into two groups. So this is based on presence of backbone of vertebral column column or back bone. That is one group. Then we have the other group absence of vertebral column. or backbone. So, this is one criteria that is used to classify organisms. Now, we will discuss an activity and see how we can do that. Because you have already done this in your smaller grades, you have classified organisms based on the presence and absence of vertebral column. And you know the names also. If they have a vertebral column, we call them vertebrates. If they don't have a vertebral column, what do we call them? Invertebrates. No vertebral column. So now look at all these animals. Now here you can see a snail, a crab. Now yellow fin, tuna. Now if we take these three, you can see now this lives in land. A terrestrial animal. These two live in water. Then dog, cock, butterfly, again they live on land, terrestrial animals. Again the python, spider, lion, all these live on land. So you would have seen most of these animals in your environment, maybe in the zoo or at least in books, documentaries, you would have seen all these animals. So you know what they are. You can 
observe them carefully and identify whether they have a vertebral column or not. Now look at the first one. It is a snail. Now does this have a vertebral column? No. It has a very soft body and it has a shell around it. It doesn't have a vertebral column or a backbone. So this comes under that group. So what we are supposed to do is, we are supposed to do this activity to classify animals based on presence or absence of a vertebral column. So to make it easy, I have already drawn the table here. You can have it up and down or you can have it side by side. It doesn't matter. Or you can even write it down as a list. That is also okay. Only thing is you have to classify them carefully. So now, if I classify these animals. So we said snail doesn't have a backbone. So presence of vertebral column, absence of vertebral column. So snail will come under absence of vertebral column. Then what is this? The crab. Now some of y'all eat crabs, some of y'all don't eat crabs. But still you know the crab doesn't have a vertebral column. It has a shell around it but inside it is that body, the flesh. But it doesn't have a backbone. So again crab also comes under absence of vertebral column. What about yellowfin tuna? It's a fish and here you can understand or you would have seen that the fishes have a bone. They have a skeleton and they have that backbone. So the yellowfin tuna has vertebral column. So it comes under presence of vertebral column. Yellowfin tuna. Then dog. Obviously, you know it has a vertebral column, dog. Some animals, it's very obvious. You know that they have. Now, we know we have a backbone. Like that, we know a dog has a backbone. What about the cock? That also, if you look closely, it has a backbone there. So, that also presence of backbone. Then a butterfly. You would have enjoyed seeing butterflies flying around. But do they have a backbone? No. Why? If you look at it, this part is the body. These are the nice colorful wings. But that body part does not have a vertebral column. So butterfly absence of vertebral column. Butterfly. Then what do we have here? Now python. Now this is somewhat tricky. Now how do these pythons, the snakes, they move? They can nicely curve, curve, curve and move around. So sometimes we might think, okay, they are so flexible. Now we can't bend our body like that, but the snake can. So we might think that it doesn't have a vertebral column. That's wrong. It has a vertebral column. It has a backbone. So python has a backbone. So it comes under presence of vertebral column. Python. Then the next one. The spider. Now you have seen spiders. Some of y'all are really scared. Some of y'all look at the spider. Some of y'all look at the spider making the web. It has a very good technique of making that spider web. But does it have a backbone? That's the question. It's a tiny insect. You can look closely or you would have understood that it does not have a backbone. So it comes under absence of vertebral column. Spider. Then lion. Again something very obvious. You can see that backbone structure also in a lion. So a lion has a vertebral column or a backbone. So presence of backbone. Now look at the list. Have we classified them correctly? Now if you were to do it also, you could have done this. 
because you can observe the animals closely and you can understand and identify whether they have a vertebral column or not. So under presence of vertebral column, yellowfin tuna, dog, cock, python, lion. Now consider all these organisms or all these animals. Now what is the common property? Now this, this, this and python. Now do they look the same? Of course, okay, dog and lion, they have four legs, something similar. But now the fish, the tuna, the python, cock has two legs. So here, if you look at all these animals, they are different from each other. But we have put them into one group based on what? The presence of vertebral column. The same way snail, crab, butterfly and spider, they look totally different from each other. But they also come under one group. Why? Because they don't have a vertebral column or backbone. So now see, one criteria is used to divide them into two main groups. Understand that term, main groups. So as we discussed, now these are different. So we have to put them into different groups again. So the main groups are vertebrates and invertebrates. So can you all understand that clearly? Okay, so then we will move on to the next one. Animals can be classified into two groups based on the presence or absence of a backbone. So that is what we did now, no? I'm sure you all are very clear with that. So based on this, what are the two main groups? Animals. If we have the animals, we can classify them as how? How do we classify them? We can separate them into two main groups. What are the two main groups? Invertebrates and vertebrates. So what are these invertebrates? Animals that do not have a vertebral column. Again, we are writing the same features or backbone. So, if anyone asks you to explain what an invertebrate is, you can simply say animals that do not have a vertebral column or a backbone are classified as or grouped as invertebrates. So, then what about vertebrates? They are the animals that have a vertebral column or backbone. So again as I told you, now all these two groups, all the animals are classified into two main groups based on the presence or absence of vertebral column. But there are differences among those organisms, among those animals. So because of that, now we are going to see or we are going to discuss how we can classify these animals further into groups. So then I will move on to the next one. Now here, this is an assignment. This is again to understand how you can classify organisms. So, Assignment, observe 
given diagrams of the invertebrate animal species. Now, this is an assignment given in your textbook. Now, look at the terms invertebrate. So, you know they don't have a backbone. Animal species. Do you know the meaning of species? They are again individually different animals. So, here if you take the first one, leech is a certain type of animal that has certain characteristics. So, you can obviously differentiate the leech from the bivalve. So, that is a different animal, that is a different species. So, leech, bivalve, then we have a beetle, a sea anemone, dragonfly and a slug. Now, have you all seen these animals? I am sure you would have seen a leech. It lives in this watery environment where there is grass, a grassland which is very moist, watery, wet kind of environment. You would have seen the leech. Then this bivalve, it's in the sea. Then beetles, you know, beetles live in all these trees and in gardens or the uh, different plantations, you would have seen different types of beetles. Again, sea anemone. From the name itself, you know, it's in the sea. So, sea anemone, but you can see here, sea anemone is actually fixed to the substrate. Now, all these can move around, but sea anemone is actually fixed to the substrate, where it lives, it's fixed there. So, then the dragonfly, it flies around, very tiny, a fly, an insect, dragonfly. Then we have the slug. Slug is also something, I think you would have seen, something similar to a snail. You would have seen, it just, you know, goes on the soil, this particular animal. So, these are all invertebrates. Now, under these invertebrates, they are all different. So, now what have we got to do? We have to classify them based on different criteria. So, you have to do it. Classify them based on different criteria. Now, immediately when you look at these, how can you classify them? Now, one character I told you all, actually two characters. One thing I told you all, about where they live, whether it's in the water environment, what do we call that? Aquatic environment. Whether it's in the aquatic environment or whether they are on land, that is terrestrial environment. So, what is that? That is based on habitat. So, now if we just consider, now I'm just guiding you, I'm giving you all an idea as to how you can classify them, but you can do it in different ways also. So, you can consider their habitat, that is where they live. Then what else? As you look at the pictures, you can see, you can see whether they can move or not. That's based on locomotion. So, that is another one, locomotion, that also I told you, locomotion. Now, this I said is sedentary. In one place, it can't move. It's fixed to the substrate. So, it's sedentary. But all these, they can move. Then, uh, under locomotion, what can you think of? You can see here now this dragonfly, the beetle, they have legs or they have appendages. But others, the other four, leech, bivalve, sea anemone, slug, they don't have an appendage structure. Like a leg is not there. So, there you can say appendages based on their appendages. What else can you think of? Now, here you can see you can nicely observe this shell. I am sure you like to even collect shells like this. So, this particular bivalve has a shell around its body. But if you take this beetle, now, this insect has a very kind of a stiff, hard, not very, very hard, but somewhat hard covering compared to this leech. And you can see the sea anemone also looks very soft. 
So the type of body. Now these are somewhat soft or slimy kind of watery. Whereas they have a shell. Now this has a very thick layer, stiff, strong layer around it. So like that depending on the shell or what we call as the exoskeleton. Exo means outside a skeleton, a cover around them. So based on those also, you can classify them. So I will just write it as shell. Now this again, as I said, I am giving you all an idea as to how to classify these. Then another one you can look at. Now we said appendages, whether they can walk or whether they crawl or whether they don't move at all. At the same time, now if you take this dragonfly, it has these small wings. What about the beetle? That also flies. So you have seen the wings. So again, they have wings. But the other four animals, they don't have wings. So even based on that, you can classify them. Now these are some examples, students. I told you all, I'm just giving you a guideline. I'm just telling you all how you can do it. But I am sure you can come up with so many other features. So you can do that. So once you do that, you will see. Now when you use different criteria. One criteria, these two come together. Another criteria, now say habitat, they are both in the water environment. They come under the same group. But when you talk about locomotion, they go to different groups. So you can understand when you use different criteria, there are different ways of classifying animals. So that can become a bit complicated. We discussed that before also. So what have they done? They have proposed a proper scientific classification for animals. So that is what we are going to do now. So then I will move on to the next slide. So under this classification, invertebrates are scientifically classified using their common features. So here the term scientifically. So when we say scientifically, we don't just look at one character. You have to look at many features, many common characteristics. So you will see how interesting that is. What we have thought as a different type of organism belong to the same group. Sometimes what we thought as belonging to the same group, they belong to different groups. So now we will discuss all that. Okay. So here invertebrates are scientifically classified using their common features. Some of the groups are given below. So these are the groups that you need to learn. You have to remember their names. You have to remember the spelling of the group name and you need to understand the features and the animals belonging to those groups. So the first group is Nidaria. Nidaria. When we say Nidaria, we can call them Nidarians. Another name is given to them. They are also called Sealantarids. But the, the name we are going to use is Nidaria. Then we have the Analida. Analida. Analids. Analids are usually worms. Analida. Then we have Mollusca. Mollusca or mollusks. Then we have arthropoda. Arthropoda are called arthropods. So the group is arthropoda. If you look at an animal, you can say, okay, this is an arthropod. Likewise, Nidaria is the name of the group. You look at the animal and say, okay, this is a Nidaria. Analida is the group. Okay, this is an analid, analid worm. Then mollusca, this is a mollusk. So like that, we can 
refer to different animals belonging to this group. So you have to remember these four invertebrate groups. These are all invertebrate groups. So a common character for all these organisms, they don't have a backbone or they don't have a vertebral column. So they are all invertebrates. What are they? Nidaria, Annelida, Mollusca and Arthropoda. So now we have to discuss them one by one. First we will look at Nidarians. So the first group that is an invertebrate group. This is Nidaria. Now first look at these animals. All of them don't have a vertebral column or a backbone. Now just immediately when you look at them, you can't really see any common feature. So you must be wondering why they belong to the same group, Nidaria. But if you look at them closely, now look at this shape. Now this looks like something like a plant. But really look at this shape. It has a something like a cylindrical shape. Now just think it's something like this particular shape. And here it is like a circle. The same way now take this one. That is also something like a circle. And it is like a sack. But only thing is it's short. Now this is long or taller kind of compared to that. That is a kind of a short organism. This is called Hydra. The name of this Nidarian is Hydra. This is sea animal. Then we have another one, jellyfish. Now here look at this jellyfish. Now this also has a circle like shape. Now you have identified one similarity. If you look at them from the top, they have some kind of a circle like shape. Then another one. Now look at these two. Now these two are actually fixed to the substrate. Wherever they live, they are fixed to the substrate. So they can't move around. We call them sedentary. So these two forms are sedentary forms. But you know that jellyfish swims around. It moves around. So that is a free floating organism. It can move around. Free floating. So that's a difference between these two are same that is different. Again here you can see these structures like you know finger like things hair like structures. Here also there are a lot like that. Those are the tentacles. So that is again a common feature. So these three animals hydra, sea anemone and jellyfish they all belong to the group Nidaria. And this is an invertebrate group. Now if we look at the common features, they are predators. What is the meaning of predators? They catch their prey. So that means they catch other animals for their food. So they eat other animals for their food. So although these two are sedentary, they are in one place, they are fixed to the substrate, they can move their tentacles like this and when a very tiny insect or a small fish or some kind of a small worm, something that floats with water, if they can catch it, they catch it with the tentacles and they consume it as food. So that is why we say they are predators. They feed on other animals. So predators. Then if we look at all these organisms, they all live in water. Now hydra usually in the sea. Sea anemone from the name you know it's in water. And jellyfish also I said it's a free floating animal. So it has to float in water. So and you have seen there are different types of jellyfishes. Sometimes you don't even know that it is a jellyfish. It's very transparent. It's just floating like a piece of tissue in water. But it is an animal. So these three are the cnidarians. Now we will look at their common properties or features of cnidaria. Features of cnidaria. 
Now cnidarians have radially symmetrical body. Now remember what I showed you all before. All of them have this circle like nature. Because of that their body is radially symmetric. I will explain that. Radially symmetric body. Now if you look at a structure like this. Okay. Now that is what I showed you. No? They have either cylindrical structure, the hydra, sea animanimus, more broader, short. But still from top when you look at it, they have this circular shape. Now how about the jellyfish? That was also like a cap but at the bottom you can see it has a circle like shape. So if you take this and if you try to divide the body. Now symmetry means you should be able to divide the body of an animal into two equal halves like two mirror images and they have to be equal. Then that line is known as the axis of symmetry. Now let's say if we take this circle, if I draw an axis like this, now you know it's divided into equal halves. So that is one axis of symmetry. Now what about another line like this? That also divides the circle into equal halves. Now if you draw this line, this and this are equal. If you draw this line, the top half and the bottom half are equal. Now can I divide it in any other way? Yes, through the radius, if I draw through the center of the circle, you know this is the center of the circle and this line, it's along the radius of the circle. If we draw another line, that also will divide the circle into equal halves. Similar to that, I can have a line like this and many other lines. So this type of body shape where you have more than one axis of symmetry. So you have to understand that more than one axis of symmetry is known as radially symmetrical body. So these are the axis of symmetry. Many. Right? So here you can see many axes of symmetry. So now can you all relate the body shape of hydra, sea anemone and jellyfish to this radially symmetrical body? You can do that. So you can remember that always students when you look at these features relate them to the animals that belong to the group. Then you can understand and remember them very easy. Radially symmetrical body. Many axes of symmetry. That is one feature. Then the next one. There are two forms. Now when we looked at the example, I told you all hydra and sea anemone, they are sedentary. I used that word sedentary and I said they are fixed to the substrate. So if you take that, now say like this, if you look at the sea anemone, it is fixed to the substrate like this and these are the tentacles, sea anemone. Now this particular form is called the polyp form. It is a polyp. That is one particular body structure. There are two forms. The polyps are fixed to the substrate and lead a sedentary life. They are only in that place. They can't move around. That is the meaning of sedentary. So that is the polyp. Then we saw the jellyfish. Now how did this jellyfish look like? It was something like this, no? You saw these structures. Now they can float around. They are free floating. Now this is jellyfish. This jellyfish can 
float around in water. So, this is Medusa. This is known as Medusa. Now, Medusa is a free floating organism that can move around. So, here you can see there are two forms. Polyps are fixed to the substrate and lead a sedentary life that is this. And Medusa that is jellyfish. Jellyfish that is free floating organism. So, Hydra and same Animania polyps. Jellyfish is a Medusa. So, the Cnidarians have two body forms. What is the first one? A polyp that is fixed to the substrate and they lead a sedentary lifestyle. And the Medusa are free floating organisms. Now, again, relate them to the examples. Is it clear to you all now? Okay. So, then the next one. Now, we already saw or we already discussed that they are predators. What did I say predators are? They catch another animal as their food and they consume it. So, that is the meaning of predators. So, as predators, they feed on small creatures. So, they use small creatures as food. That is their prey. You have to remember these words. Prey, predator. So, you can relate one character to another character. So, what they do is, now here see these are tentacles. Now, this is what is a tentacle is. Tentacle. Now, they are sedentary. They are fixed to the substrate. But they need food. So, what they do is they move their tentacles like this, like fingers. They are moving. And if you look at these tips of the tentacles, there is a structure called the nidocyte. Now, look at this word, nidocyte. Now, these nidocytes are used to cripple small creatures. Either it can be a very small worm or some small creature. So, they use small creatures as food. They cripple small creatures with poisonous substance. It is a poisonous substance secreted by nidocytes. And these nidocytes are actually found at the tips somewhere here. They have these nidocytes at the tips of the tentacle. So, what this nidocyte does is it secretes a poisonous substance. So, when that poison goes into the insect, the insect gets crippled. You know the meaning of crippled. They can't move. The insect or the small creature can't move around. So, they are crippled by the poison secreted by the nidocyte present in their tentacles. So, the nidocytes are the specialized organelles on their tentacles. Specialized, they have a special function. What is that special function? To cripple the prey or the small creatures. So now can you all understand all the features? We are looking at the first invertebrate group that is the Nidarians and under Nidarians what did we say? They all live in water, aquatic environment and they are predators and the examples hydra, sea anemone and jellyfish. Then the properties or features, they are radially symmetrical body. They have a radially symmetrical body. Then there are two forms, the polyps are fixed to the substrate and lead a sedentary life, medusa are free floating organisms and then they use small creatures as food. They are predators. They creatures are the prey. So, they cripple small creatures with poisonous substance created by nidocytes and nidocytes are the specialized organelles on their tentacles. Is that clear to you all? So, you have to understand the features and when studying, if you relate the features to the animals, the examples, 
then it will be very easy for you to understand and remember. So then I will move on to the next slide. The body form of Nidarium that is Hydra. So the body form of Hydra is given to you. When you are given this picture, you should know to label the parts. So this is a body form of Nidarian. I told you Nidaria is the group. But when we talk about an animal, we say Nidarian. What is the other name I mentioned? It is a Sealanthare. Sealanthare is another name given for Nidarian. Just remember that. Keep that in mind. So here. Look at the structure again. Now you can understand. Now this is a, as you see, you can identify this is a, is it a polyp or a medusa? This is a polyp structure. So from the example hydra itself, you know it is a polyp. So it's a sedentary form. Now here see, it's attached to the substrate, fixed to the substrate. So it can't move around and you can see that something like a cylinder like structure. Cylinder means not an exact cylinder like what you draw for mats and all but somewhat similar body shape. So you can understand the radially symmetric body form and you can see here this is the mouth of the hydra. This part there is a small opening here yeah? that is the mouth. So what did I say? They are fixed to the substrate. Their tentacles are moving like this. And a, in, a prey comes in between. A small creature. What do they do? They hold, they cover the creature with their tentacles. And they secrete that poisonous substance. The nidocytes secrete that poisonous substance. Immediately what happens? The creature gets crippled. It can't move around. Then they push the creature to their mouth so that they can consume it as food. That is how they act as predators. So what are these? These structures? They are the tentacles. Tentacle. So since it's one I have put it written it as tentacle. When there are many we say tentacles. So they actually have many tentacles. Now can you all understand the body form of a Nidarian? Yes, this is the polyp structure. So the example is Hydra. So when they give you the Hydra or the sea anemone or the jellyfish. Now you know there are two forms so you can't get confused. They belong to the same group Nidaria and that is an invertebrate. Is that clear to you all now? Okay. So then I will move on to the next one. Now this is an extra knowledge given in your textbook. Now why is this given to you? Now look at this structure. I am sure you would have enjoyed watching this either in the seaside or uh, watching TV online. You would have observed these coral reefs. Now they are related to Nidaria. We will see how. So this is for extra knowledge. The coral polyps. Now can you see the relationship? Coral polyps. All these time we call them as corals. Coral reefs. Now we remember the term. Coral polyps. So polyps are Nidarians. The coral polyps belong to the Nidaria group build up coral reefs. So what is a coral reef? When these polyps live together like a colony, a lot of polyps live together and they make this coral reef. So this is very nice. It actually looks like very colorful plants. So earlier also I told you. But they are actually animals. Underwater they are animals. They are polyps, so they are sedentary, they don't move around. They are fixed to the substrate and they are living organisms. They are not rocks, they are living organisms. You have to remember that. And these coral reefs are very, very important to us. One thing, it gives beauty to the 
sea environment. And it's very useful. It reduces the speed of waves. So it helps to have the sea level at a certain point like that. It's very, very important for nature. So we have to make sure that we preserve our coral reefs. Our country is rich in coral reefs. There are many places. I'm sure you might have visited the coral reefs. You would have enjoyed looking at them. So that is very, very important to us. And now you know that they are living animals. They belong to the group Nidaria. So that is an invertebrate and it is a polyp. So with that, now I am going to move on to the next group. That is also an invertebrate group. That is Annelida, the second group of invertebrates. So they also don't have a backbone, no backbone or no vertebral column. So again, we look at the annelids and where they live. Now you can see first one, marine environment. Then fresh water. Then wet terrestrial environment. Now can you all see the similarity? They need water. Somehow they need water. It has to be marine, the sea or it has to be fresh water. Any type of water is fine for them. Otherwise if they are in the terrestrial environment, it has to be wet. Very important. So they live in places where there is water. Either lot of water or small amount of water. Now these two together can be commonly called as aquatic environment. Aquatic environment. Aquatic environment. Water. Fresh water, marine water. What's the difference? Marine water is salty. There is lot of salt dissolved in marine water. Fresh water, no salts. So, but both are aquatic environment or terrestrial, wet terrestrial environment, the land environment. So, that is where you can get these annelids, annelida, annelids. So, let's look at some examples. Earthworm. Now, look at this earthworm. I am sure you are familiar with earthworms. You might have seen it. You know what they are. So from the name you know, they live on earth, they live in the soil and they are very, very important to the soil, especially in agriculture, in a paddy field, they live in the soil, they move through the soil. So what they do is they loosen the soil. So because the soil becomes loose, there is a lot of air supply, air goes into those spaces. So that increases the quality of soil. The same way these annelids, the earthworms, they eat all these waste material and they give nutrition to the soil. So like that, they are very, very important in the environment. Earth worm. So worm, the term worm. Then look at this leech. Now that is comparatively shorter than the earthworm, but also you all can see similar nature. Now this looks shiny. Why does this look shiny? That's because it's moist. It's watery. The surface is moist. So they all need water environment. So here this earthworm, leech. Where do you find leech commonly? In grasslands or where there is lot of grass but where it is very very moist. Watery area. So wet terrestrial environment. Earthworm, leech. Then Neris. Neris is another annelid or an annelid worm, annelida. So that also has a similar structure. There are differences and similarities. Now look at this worm. Now if you look at this structure closely, now this is a worm. So look at this worm. Now, if you look at the body closely, now you can see lines like that. 
they are not just lines those are like blocks connected together and those small blocks are called segments so these are segments now this whole worm the earthworm is made up of segments that means their body is segmented we say the body is segmented because of that we call them as segmented worms now can you see that here if you really look closely you can see those segments here also a leaf the same thing for these nerves that is also an anel so now all these worms they are worms so because of that they have a worm like body and they are segmented worms so that is something common to all these but here you can see here there is a different structure now this has a mouth and an anus is there through the mouth they consume their food through the anus they give out their excretion now here the leech has suckers you might have seen the leech movie now i like this it has one sucker it keeps the other sucker comes closer moves like that it moves now the earthworm just goes with its body there is also you would have seen it goes like this and you have these pair of appendages in that nerves work so they are similar but they do have special properties you have to understand that and when you are given the three structures you should know to identify them and there is one more students now look at the way the names have been written earthworm leech and nerves now this is a scientific i'm not going into detail but just remember when you are writing it here it is printed there is a way of doing it these are common names so they have been printed in the with the normal letters but here you can notice this is printed in italics just remember that for now you will be discussing how the scientific naming is done and all that when you go to higher grades for now it's not necessary but i am sure you were wondering you might have thought why now these are in normal letters this is in italics what is the reason the reason is this is a scientific name just remember only that for now okay All right so these are the annelida group annelida an invertebrate so they are all worms with that we will look at their features the common features of annelids now here you can say body is bilaterally symmetrical now remember the worm the earthworm now the body was something like this i said here there is the mouth and there is an anus here and these are segmented now when you say segmented and also the nerves you saw it's worm but somewhat flat now although these are worms these don't have a cylindrical structure their shape is different the leech also you saw in between it was very broad it was somewhat small at the ends and the nerves is somewhat flat so earlier we discussed radial symmetry is that possible here can you use any axis no here it's only one axis of symmetry so if we consider this particular shape like a rectangle kind of shape something like this now this is the body form of an annelid a worm now he also they have a certain structure here another different structure they are so because of that you can you can cut them into two equal halves only through one 
axis of symmetry. So that is why it is bilaterally symmetrical body. Bilaterally symmetrical body. Okay. You have to understand that clearly students. Now first if you look at the worm you might think okay that is like a tube. We can cut it using any axis into two halves. That's not possible because it has the mouth, it has the anus. You all know the mouth. The shape can vary. The anus can be a certain structure. Then there was a structure here. You saw the leech. So all of them can only be divided into two equal halves by one axis of symmetry. So because of that we call them bilaterally symmetrical. That is one feature you have to remember. Earthworm, leech and nares. Then they are vermiform. Now another term, vermiform, worm-like body. That is the mean, worm-like body. That of course it's very easy to remember. All what we saw, earthworm from the worm you know it's a worm. And you know this is the worm-like body shape. Leech, same thing. Mary is also same thing. So they are all vermiform, worm-like body structure. Is that clear now? Can you all relate the features to the examples? I am sure you can do that. Then what is this? Body is divided into segments. That also I told you all. Now all these are segments. So body is divided into, that is what I said, the segments are kind of connected to form the body. So the full body is divided into segment. So that is why we call them as segmented verbs. Is that clear? Do you all understand all the features? So common features of analytes, body is bilaterally symmetrical. They are vermiform, that is worm-like body and body is divided into segments. These are the segments and they are known as segmented worms. So one example is earthworm, the other one is leech and the other one is nares. So now you can understand their features and they are all invertebrates. They don't have a backbone. And they belong to the group Annelida. And because of that, we call them as Annelids. Annelids. And Annelids are segmented worms. Segmented worms. So, one after the other, you can relate the features. So, that is what you need to understand about the Annelids. Now let's look at the body form of an analid. So I told you all analid, the organism, the example is earthworm. So here you should know to label the different parts of this worm. So an earthworm is given to you, easily you can identify the segment. So no, you know it is a segmented worm. I told you there is a mouth. This is the mouth part. Then here you can see the small segments. The segments and this is the anus. So through the mouth the worm takes in the food. I told you all earthworm it lives in soil and all the organic waste materials. It actually consumes those organic waste materials and through the anus part of the digested organic material comes out and that becomes nutrition. It's like a fertilizer to the soil. It adds a lot of nutrients to the soil. That is why these earthworms are very important. I told you all in agriculture they are important. So if they give you a diagram 
Now there are some animals immediately as you look at them you can identify. So here we looked at three examples earthworm, leech and nereus. So all three are analogs. You have to observe the similarity carefully and then you should know to classify it into a certain group. Is that clear now? Okay then. I will move on to the next one. So the next type of invertebrate, mollusca. So we have already discussed Cnidaria or Nidaria. Then we discussed Annelida. Now the third type, mollusca. So first we will see where these mollusks live. So now can you all see? Mollusca is the name of the group. Mollusks is the name of the or how we refer to the animals that belong to that group. So mollusks live in the following environments. The first one, terrestrial. You know what terrestrial is? The land environment. So you would have seen the snail or slug, all those living on land. Then in the marine environment, marine water, sea, ocean, then fresh water, any fresh water body. So what is the main difference between marine and fresh water? Marine water has lot of salt in it. It's a salty water, you know that. Fresh water is not salty. So these mollusks or animals of mollusca live in all three environments. Terrestrial environment, marine environment and fresh water environment. So I told you all fresh water and marine, we can commonly call them as aquatic environment, water based environment. So then we look at the examples. First one is snail. Now you have seen the snail. I am sure you would have seen all these animals. Either you would have seen in your garden or when you go to the seaside you would have seen. You might have collected shells or you have seen someone collecting shells. But that is the shell only. Here this is the bivalve. Then you would have seen these in an aquarium or the zoo or at least in a documentary or online or on TV, you would have watched these animals. So you are somewhat familiar. If you haven't seen, now it's time for you all to look at them in some way or the other. In the sense, you can refer the net to look at the animals only. You can read about them. You can watch a small uh, clip of how they move around, how they live in their environment. Or you can even watch it on TV. Or else at least you can read about them. So but I am sure you would have seen at least some of these animals. So the first one is snail. Now you have seen the snail. They have a shell over their body. And this is the shells. You can see like a spiral shape. That particular design. So that is the shell of the snail. And you have seen the body of the snail, it, you can feel it. No? When you look at it, you know it's a very soft body. So that is a soft bodied animal, soft body of the shell, uh, of the snail. And you would have seen this foot when it moves on land. You might have seen that trail, there is a line. You can identify the path of the snail. That is because of its muscular foot, it has only one foot. And also its body is moist, always wet. So because of that also you can see that trail. So that is the snail. And what are these two like these structures? That is the antenna. So they have a shell, they have a soft body, they have a muscular foot and the antenna. Now then the bivalve. Name bivalve. Bi means two. So two shells, I am sure some of you all have collected shells or you have seen shell collections. Similar, identical shells close on top of each other like this and sometimes they are when you take the shell also they are fused together. You have to open it. So have you ever realized that it is the animal? 
because we collect it after the animal is dead, we sometimes don't realize that it is part of the animal. But it is. It is a mollusk. Belongs to the group Mollusca. So bivalves inside the shells there is the animal. That also has a very soft body. So that is a mollusk. Then look at this octopus. Octo. Eight. You know those eight tentacles of octopus. But does this have a shell? No. So now can you see the first three animals? Snail, bivalve, octopus. Now these two have a shell. That's common to them. This doesn't have a shell. But still it comes under mollusca. Because it has similar features. Then if you look at the next one. Kite. Now this is like an oval shape. And you can see those marks on it. That also has a shell. These also live in aquatic environments. So kite. That is again a mollusk. Then can you see this one? Cuttlefish. Now some of y'all, I'm sure, don't eat seafood. Some of y'all eat seafood. So when your parents or some of your elders, they buy this cuttlefish and come, at least then you would have seen. But the others, as I said, there are many ways of observing these animals. So if you're interested in them, you have to observe, you have to collect information. So this is a cuttlefish. Now can you see a similarity between these two? They look somewhat similar. But these are different from these two. But all of them come under mollusca. What about this one? Slug. Now this has a more like a long structure. But this is similar to a snake. Similar. I am using the word similar. They are not identical. They are similar. That is why they all belong to the same group. So they have similar properties. You can see the soft body here, the antenna here. All that is visible. So all these are examples of mollusk or the animals that belong to the group mollusca. Snail, bivalve, chitin, slug, cuttlefish and octopus. So to make it more clear to you, I have included all the pictures here. So you have to remember, immediately when I say or when you see the question about a mollusk in a paper, you have to remember all these animals. You can relate them to the real animals that you have seen. That is also good. But at least you have to remember the pictures. So you have to remember the examples and their features. So where do they live? Mollusks live in the following environments. Terrestrial, marine and fresh water. And these are the examples. So what do we have to discuss next? The features of mollusks. Features of mollusks. Now can you see? Mollusca is the name of the group. Mollusky, mollusk is the animal. So these are the features. Again bilaterally symmetrical. Now you can think of that. Now octopus has a body shape like this. No, with all those. This is how we draw when we are in the smaller grades. No, like this. So here because of its body structure you can cut across the animal only through one axis of symmetry. Just one axis of symmetry. So one Axis of symmetry. So that is why they are bilaterally symmetric animals. So one property. Then I told you soft body. Now I told you all the snail. You know it has a you know kind of a shell like this. But here you know this soft body inside. The muscular foot muscular foot and inside they have a soft body. So because of that we call them soft bodied animals. This is actually a term used to refer the mollusks. Soft bodied animals. All of them, even the octopus has a soft body. Cuttlefish has a soft body. 
slug, bivalve, snail, all of them have soft bodies. And here they have a shell. Some of them have a shell. Possesses a muscular foot. So you have seen when it moves on land, you see that marking I told you. That is due to the muscular foot that is dragged along the surface as well as due to the moist body. So it has a muscular foot and it has a skin. Possesses a skin moistened with mucus. Mucus is a secretion that is produced by the mollusk, the animal itself, to keep its body moist. Otherwise, if it dries, it can't survive. So it has to be always moist, it has to be wet. So for that, there is a secretion called mucus. So possesses a skin moistened with mucus. You have to remember that. So as I told you, you have to relate the example with their features. Then only it will be easy for you to remember. Can you understand that? Okay. And some molars, they are shells. So here you can see students, the snail, the bivalve and the chitons. They all had a shell. So it says some molars, they are shell. But the others, the octopus, the slug, they did not have a shell. So that is how you have to remember all the examples. So the features of mollusks, bilaterally symmetrical, soft-bodied animals, possesses a muscular foot, possesses a skin moistened with mucus, and some molars bear shells. So you can relate them to the examples. Oc this is an octopus and that is a snake. This is just a diagrammatic representation students. So that you understand the features. But you know to identify the organisms. If you are given the picture, if you are given the diagram, you should know to identify them. So with that, now we will see the parts of the body form of mollusk. So body form of a mollusk is given to you. You can see it is the snail that is shown here. So when you are given a diagram like this, you should be able to label the parts that you have to remember. So the diagram I drew, the shell was different. But you all have seen a snail. You know how it looks like. So here this part like that spiral coil like nature and the hard structure that is the shell. So immediately you can identify it. this is the shell. Then what is this? I told you all those two structures. Those are the antenna. Antenna. And this is the mouth of the mollusk, mouth of the snake mouth and here you can see this structure there is only one foot and that is a muscular foot that is a special thing muscular foot this part is the muscular foot and inside the shell the muscular body the soft body will be there so what do we call them we call them as the soft bodied animals the soft bodied animals can you all understand that okay so this is the body form of a mollusk a snail so if you are given the diagram you should know this is the shell the antenna the mouth and the muscular foot you can't see the soft body because it's inside the shell and you have seen when they get scared when they feel that there is some danger outside, what does the snail do? It goes into the shell. So sometimes you only see the shell, but you don't see the snail. So that is there for protection. One function, one purpose of that shell is protection. So that is a feature that you have to remember. Is that clear to you all students? Okay. So then I am going to move on to the next one. That is the fourth group of invertebrates. Nidaria, 
Annelida, Mollusca and now Arthropoda. Now this is very very interesting. First point, Arthropods live in terrestrial environments, aquatic environments. So when we say terrestrial land, aquatic water, that means all types of water, marine water, fresh water, all types of water. I introduce that term to you. So terrestrial environment and aquatic. So basically all the different environments except aerial, but here sometimes you get arthropods flying in air also. So, but we say they live in terrestrial environment and aquatic environment. Then I said it's very interesting. The reason is this. Arthropod is the group to which the highest number of animals belong. So, so far we have been discussing the invertebrates. There are the vertebrates also. But if you look at all these groups, this is the group to which the highest number of animals belong. So there are many, many different types of animals. So here are some examples given to you. Now insects. What are insects? Can you identify an insect from the picture? You can see butterfly. Butterfly is an insect. What else? In your environment, in your household, you see many insects. Can you name some of them? Obviously, you know the mosquito, the cockroach, the beetle. Under beetle, there are so many different types of beetles. The butterfly. All these are different types of insects. Even the dragonfly. We saw the dragonfly before in one of the slides. So, all these are different types of insects. So, when we say insects, there are a lot of insects. So, highest number of animals. Even the insects are many types. Those are the arthropods that can fly around. Insects are the arthropods that can fly. So, they have the wings. Butterfly has wings. You would have admired these wings. The different patterns, the different colors. They are very, very beautiful. So those are arthropods, they are insects. So the arthropods that can fly usually come under insects. So that's one example. Then the spider. When we say spider, they are somewhat scary. You know the spider, but as I told you before, they nicely make those spider webs. So spider is also an arthropod. Now insect spiders, they both belong to arthropod. Now this term arthropoda, that has a meaning. Arthro means joint. I will write that here. Arthro means jointed. Normally poda means legs. So legs. Or here we actually mean the appendages. So arthropoda means these are animals, these are invertebrates that have jointed appendages. So now look at this spider. You can see the appendages, you can see those jointed nature. They are not straight. They are not just one line. They are joint. Even in the butterfly, if you look at their appendages, those are joint. Then another example here, crab. Now you can see these appendages. You can see the structure like this. They are joint. At these parts, they are joint. The same things for the spider. So crab. Spider now, crab you know lives in the water environment, seaside, aquatic environment. Spider, terrestrial environment. Now look at this millipede. Why do we call them millipedes? Millions of legs, milli, many number of legs, peds, legs. So here you can see those are also like the appendages. Even those are jointed appendages. Millipede. Then the butterfly. Again, scorpion. You can easily identify this 
disjointed appendages. You know what scorpions are. And here they have a very strong exoskeleton. That is also something common. You can observe that in a crab, the shell of the crab, the scorpion has that exoskeleton. Exo mean out. Skeleton means the skeletal structure, the outer cover. That is a very strong exoskeleton or external skeleton. Crab, scorpion, you can identify it easily. Even the prawn, you can see that exoskeleton, the cover. You would have seen that. Then the centipede, that also has that cover. Here, their appendages are very tiny, but if you look at it closely, even the mosquito, I told you all the insects, when the mosquitoes come and bite you, you would have sometimes observed it closely. You would have seen those jointed appendages. They are not just straight one line. They are bent. So the meaning of arthropoda is jointed appendages. Crab, spider, millipede, butterfly, scorpion, centipede and prawn. So now here you can see crab, prawn, they live in aquatic environment. The others, terrestrial environment. So then insects, they have wings because they can fly. So you can see so many different types of arthropods. So arthropods live in terrestrial environments and aquatic environments. An arthropoda is the group to which the highest number of, very important, highest number of animals belongs. And as examples, insects, the spider, the scorpion, then we have the millipede over there, centipede here, the prawn is shown to you and the crab. So all these are examples of arthropods. Now that you know what they are, you can relate many other animals to arthropod. But then when you do that, you have to be careful. Now we are discussing the scientific way of classifying. You can't just randomly pick and put an animal into arthropoda. You have to look at their features carefully. So that is what we are going to look, do now. We are going to discuss the features of arthropods. So here again, they are bilaterally symmetrical. That you can understand. You saw the butterfly. Now butterfly has a like body here and this these wings, the wings have to be symmetrical. Now in my drawing it might look different, but normally if you look at the real butterfly, it will have similar identical shaped wings. So this has a bilaterally symmetrical body. So you can cut across by one axis only. So if we look at the features, one axis of symmetry. Now that is why we say bilaterally symmetric. Through one axis, you can divide the body into two equal halves. Bilaterally symmetrical body or bilaterally symmetrical animals. Then what is the next one? Their body possesses an external skeleton or the exoskeleton. Now you saw the, so if you take the structure of a crab, this is the shell. What we call as the shell, but it is the exoskeleton. Skeleton. So that shell is the external, external is outside, Ex exo also means outside, exoskeleton. In the crab we saw that, then I told you even the prawns have the exoskeleton, you can see the insects, the cover, all those have the exoskeleton. Even the scorpion, you can see the exoskeleton. So that is a special property of arthropoda. Then I explain the term arthropods. Arthro means jointed. 
coda means legs but here we refer to the appendages. So then some species possess wings. So here you can see this is a wing. So when they have a wing we call them as insects. Arthropods with wings are usually called insects or the insects are arthropods with wings. I am sure you can in addition to what I told you all, you can think of many other insects. Can you do that? Yes, because some of you all might even have the interest of observing insects. You might have collected a lot of information. Although you all are still very young, still some of you all are very keen in learning about animals. So you all might know more information. That is very good. So insects, some species, they possess wings. Then they have externally segmented body. Now we have discussed segmented body before. They are the worm, annelid worms, they were completely segmented body. The body itself was more made of segments. But here you have to look at the term externally segmented body. Now when we say externally segmented, if you look at the shape of the body, it will be something like this. Now outside there you can see the three parts of the body. Normally when you look at a beetle, an insect, sometimes you see two parts, some you see three parts. So that is only from the outside. So externally segmented body, that is the externally segmented body. You can notice that in most of the arthropods or arthropoda, animals belonging to the group arthropoda. And all arthropods, this is also very important, all arthropods have jointed appendages. So if you look at the crab, you can see like this, they had the jointed appendages. Even these insects also, they have like jointed appendages. So that is also a special feature. Now again, can you all relate all the features to the organisms? I told you all, if you do that, it's easy for you to understand and remember the features, the examples for each of these groups. So now this is the fourth group of invertebrate. So what is coming next? When you are given the diagram of a body form of an arthropod, you should be able to identify the parts. Body features of an arthropoda. So here an insect is given. What is this insect? It is a cockroach. You know that. So if you are normally given an insect, you should be able to identify the parts. Now all the features, shall we just go through the features again? Here you can see the jointed appendages. Nicely it's visible. Jointed appendages, arthropods. Then they are bilaterally symmetrical. Only through one axis of symmetry. Also you can see the externally segmented body. Now this is segment, another segment, the other segments you can see the externally segmented body. Then this exoskeleton. Outside you see that brown color shiny layer that's somewhat very stiff. That is their external or exoskeleton. And also some of them have the wings. So now can you relate all the features? I am sure you can. So then you should be able to label these parts. Now what is this? It is the eye. Eye of the cockroach. So here we have the eyes or I will say eye because it points to only one. Then this one, the two structures, those are the antenna. Antenna. Then here you can see the wings and here you can see the jointed appendage. 
jointed appendage so that is what you have to know about arthropods we saw where they live terrestrial and aquatic then all the different examples and what is the speciality to this group one thing they are they contain the highest number of species so many different animals and also they have this jointed appendage they have the externally segmented body some of them possess wings and they are bilaterally symmetrical so those are what you need to remember about arthropods with that i will move on to the next slide here they have given you all an assignment can you see this assignment this is to make an insect box assignment collect the bodies of dead insects get a box it can be wood metal or cardboard and fix a piece of styrofoam to the bottom of the box fix the bodies on the styrofoam using long pins paste a name tag for each insect and discuss with your teacher how to keep the bodies of insects without decay so the picture shown here is an insect box so i told you all now there are so many insects very tiny insects large insects different sizes different shapes different colors and they are very interesting to look at they have those wings so with that what people do is when they are very interested in learning about insects they collect so when collecting we are collecting the dead insect you are not going to kill the insect you are going to collect the dead insect so it's not something harmful to the arthropod so after it is dead you have to collect the insect it's not only you you can get the help of your friends your elders family members everyone can help you they can contribute you can tell them okay when you see a dead insect give it to me so they will give you have to collect them after collecting them you don't directly make an insect box you have to preserve it either you can put it into a container and put it in the fridge so that inside the fridge they get frozen and they will get preserved otherwise there are other chemicals that are used in the lab because inside although they are there dead they are bodies they are no so when you keep it for a long time that can undergo changes so watery substances can come out so to prevent that either you can allow it to dry you can put it in the fridge or you can put some chemicals that is what you have to discuss with your teachers for different insects there are different methods i am not going to go into detail there so now you have a collection of insects now you have preserved them either dried them or you it's all ready to make the insect box then what do we do we take a box either it can be a wooden box it can be a metal box or it can be a cardboard doesn't matter but it has to be somewhat short it can't be a very tall box like that it shouldn't be too high then you can't put the insect and take it out it has to be somewhat short and also it's better if the cover is lid is fixed to it or it can be a lid that you can put and take it off either way it's fine sometimes at home when you buy these some ornaments medals or sometimes jewelry don't go, don't go to take the gold jewelry boxes but you know imitation jewelry fancy items you might get these nice boxes so you can use one of those boxes what you do is you take a clean box then you have to take styrofoam what is styrofoam it's regiform so you have to cut the regiform according to the correct size so that you can put it into the box and to make it better you can cover the regiform with a white cloth so here inside you will have styrofoam so this is the box and this is the styrofoam or regiform covered with 
plot. Why do you need to select white? Because with white color background, you can see the insects nicely because they are also colorful. If you use a very dark colored plot, then it's not very visible. The insects won't be very visible. So white is better. If you can't get a white cloth, you might have seen in these some packaging boxes like say the TV or the phone or some kind of device or some other packing. They have that soft tissue like but regiform spongy like material, very thin. You can even cover this styrofoam with that. So through cloth and that sponge, you can put the pin. And through regiform also it goes. So no problem. So what you do is you cover the regiform nicely. You have to make sure you tuck the cloth in and you put it into the box so that it's very neat and nice. After that, now you have all the preserved animals. To each animal you put a head pin. It has to be somewhat long. So you have to nicely place the animal here, somewhere here and you put a pin. Sometimes you might need to put two pins and if they have wings you can nicely spread the wings. If it's a butterfly spread the wings and put a pin there. So like that you will have all the animals arranged in a certain order in lines and there should be enough space. After you do that you have to make sure you put a label there. Now sometimes when you go to write the full name there, it's very long. Then this becomes very untidy. It doesn't have a proper order, it's not neat, it doesn't look nice. So what we can do is we can make another list. You can take an A4 paper, you can number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and here also you can put the names as 1, 2 like that. You can put the labels and according to each insect you can have a list and you can paste that list to the lid of the box inside the lid the lid of the box you can paste it so you have the list you have the animals you can relate them but when you are doing that you have to identify the animals first if you are not sure you can look at books you can look at the internet you can search when you type types of insects they will show you a lot of types you have to look at the picture carefully. You have to look at your insect carefully and identify. Same thing if you have a book also. Or you can ask from someone who knows very well about insects. So by doing that, you can identify all the insects. So after that is done, you have preserved the insects. You have made the prepared the box. You have pinned the insects and you have the list. So then your insect box is ready. You can keep this for a very, very long time. So what is the advantage of doing this? Now one thing some of you all like to collect. That is one. The other important thing is when you go to collect organisms like this, insects like this, then only you will realize that there are so many different types, a wide variety of insects which are arthropods that are there in our environment. Sometimes we haven't even noticed it. You see them but you don't realize or you don't pay attention to that. But once you start collecting, you will understand the different varieties and also you will learn about insects. That is how you learn. Now this is for your exam, whatever needed is given in your textbook. But you can't stop with that. You have to refer, you have to collect information. Then only your knowledge increases. So one way of doing that is by making an insect box. Is that clear to you all now? Okay then. So now I have completed the discussion on invertebrates. We started off with animal classification. Then we said vertebrates and invertebrates. And under invertebrates, I have discussed the four groups. What are they? Nidaria or another name I told you all, Ceylanthreta. So Nidaria, then Annelida, 
mollusca and arthropoda the four groups again recall the names nidaria annelida mollusca and arthropoda those are the invertebrate groups so with that the discussion on invertebrates is over so after this in the next video i will be discussing the vertebrate groups with you all that also has groups they are also you will see a lot of different animals so we will discuss that vertebrate groups in the next video